Today, we're going to talk about the sensitive topic of mass shootings in the United States. Now, statistics reveal that mass and school shootings are off the charts in our country, and we have three guests to help us understand what's going on. We have Dr. Peter Langman, a psychologist who wrote Warning Signs Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike. Next, we have Catherine Schweit, a retired FBI active shooter program leader and author of Stop the Killing, How to End Mass, the Mass Shooting Crisis. And finally, we come to Mark Fullman, the national affairs editor of Mother Jones and author of Trigger Points Inside the Mission to Stop Mass Shootings in America. Now, Mark, in your book, you say guns are not the focus of your book. Kate, you say that guns and active shooters are only part of the gun discussion, yet it seems that guns are the elephant in the room. Mark, how do we look past the gun issue for solutions? Well, of course, guns are in, intrinsic to the problem of mass shootings. You wouldn't have them without the, the weapon of destruction. Uh, but, you know, in, in digging deeper into this problem over the years, I became really focused on the question of what more can we do to try to reduce mass shootings in the United States? Uh, I think most people are very familiar with the long-running debate over firearms and, and regulations of them. Uh, it's an important debate, but there are other aspects of this problem, too, that I think have been poorly understood for a long time that I try to address in, in the book. And uh, prevention as a, as a tool to tackle this problem is also very important. That goes beyond just the issue of firearms. Kate, let's have you jump in here. And why... Do we Americans have so many mass shootings? Well, I think that, you know, to your question about the guns and, oh, is it guns or isn't it guns? You know, certainly guns, as Mark said, are part of uh, is part of the problem. Right. But when we talk about guns, then we talk, turn all of our conversations into firearms or no firearms or some control over firearms. And that really doesn't get us to our discussion that we need to have about these types of shootings. And that's more to um, you know what Mark is saying, what Peter's research has shown. We are looking for solutions to a particular type of shooting and all of firearms discussions get tossed into a big bowl. And then we're fighting about guns without having any conversations about these particular prevention for these particular types of shootings. And, you know, if you, especially if you think about how maybe two out of three uh, firearms deaths in the United States are suicides, we really need to focus in on this type of shooting to see what the prevention solutions might be. Okay, Peter, let's switch over to school shootings. I mean, fresh in our minds is Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, Uvalde. And Peter, you have a different opinion on gun access? Well, when we're talking about school shootings that are perpetrated by juveniles, you know, your middle school students, your high school students, in the overwhelming majority of cases, these children are getting guns from their own homes or the homes of relatives. So for me, the issue is one of firearm safety in the home, because typically these are legally purchased and owned guns by the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, older brothers. These are legal weapons but they're not stored securely, and then troubled kids can get their hands on them and go out into the public and kill a whole lot of people. So for me, the issue relating to firearms and school shootings is firearm safety in the home. Americans are killing Americans at a greater rate, even more than foreign terrorist attacks. And we also feel like we're living in a, zone, a war zone at times. Now, Kate, is this an exceptional American problem? Uh, you know, it is uh, certainly we're at the top of the list, but we're not the only ones. And and I think the research has shown that there are other countries that have uh, similar problems, but we have the volume of, of weapons here. And, you know, to what Peter was just talking about, we're talking many times, almost always about the mass shootings. The vast majority of mass shootings are handguns um, and uh, legally acquired handguns. And in the case of younger shooters acquired in their own homes or acquired uh, because there's an unsecured gun. Some uh, research says anywhere from a third to half of the guns in the United States are, are unsecured. That might be a high number. Uh, different researchers come up with different numbers. But I know there were 7 million new guns purchased last year in homes that had no guns in them. So those are guns owners who maybe don't know how important it is to secure those guns. 
And because there are so many guns available in the United States, right, 300 million plus people, 400 million maybe guns, we know that we need to get do better at having those legally purchased, legally owned guns secured. Mark, let's switch over to you and the Mother Jones database. It's really extraordinary what you've collected over the past few years in mass shootings. What does the database reveal overall? Well, we began collecting data on public mass shootings a decade ago after the massacre in Aurora, Colorado at the movie theater. And at the time, there was almost no data available publicly about this problem, which I found quite startling when I went looking for it. Um, I think part of the issue is that it's it's a challenge to define what a mass shooting is, and there's been considerable debate about that in the years since. We took a conservative approach to identifying this problem, um, essentially the attacks that are hard to explain in terms of motive and circumstance uh, of a, a lone perpetrator going into a public place and attacking, uh, like that movie theater attack and, and so many since. And so we found several key things in studying the, these cases. Uh, there were roughly 60 or so cases that we began with. The database is now well over 130 uh, over the past decade. And within that data set, uh, we found several patterns. One is that the majority of the firearms are legally purchased, uh, used in, in these attacks. Um, more than half of the cases ended in suicide, which is a very important data point in my view, in terms of understanding the behaviors and circumstances that lead up to mass shootings. Um, we found other patterns as well, and, and one that really set me off on, on the project of writing the book Trigger Points was learning early on that there were many cases where warning signs were evident for a long period of time prior to the attack, um, different kinds of behaviors, activity, circumstances that were often noticeable to people around the offenders. And so this raises all kinds of questions, of course, in terms of prevention and what more we might be able to do to stop these from happening. Well, speaking of warning signs and perpetrators, Peter, uh, with school shootings, you've identified three categories of individuals, psychopathic, psychotic, and traumatized. Aren't these the signs of mental illness? Okay. This is a very complicated topic. And when people talk about violence and mental illness, they very rarely define what they mean by mental illness. And that's one of the, the problems. It's not that people are either mentally healthy or mentally ill. You know, a lot of people are struggling with all kinds of issues apart from what may be deemed mental illness in the sense of schizophrenia, perhaps. These are often people who are struggling in multiple domains in their lives, and they're desperate, they're angry, they may feel like they're victims of chronic injustices, and they're depressed and suicidal. They may also be full of rage and thus homicidal. And it's a combination of a whole lot of factors, psychological dynamics, family histories, often recent stresses and losses, and so on, that put someone on this path. So it's not as simple as saying these people are mentally ill. Um, we don't even necessarily know what that means until we sit down and agree upon a definition. Peter, have you found characteristic myths associated with school shooters? You know, probably the most common myth is that school shooters are bullied to the point of retaliation and seek out and kill their tormentors. This actually happens in very few cases. So there's no clear connection between being picked on and committing a school shooting. Unfortunately, bullying is very common. It probably happens in every school, maybe every day. And yet those kids who are picked on, overwhelming majority of them will never pick up a gun and hurt anyone. Bullying may be a contributing factor, but as I said, there's so many factors, psychological dynamics and depression, or maybe abuse at home and romantic rejections and academic failures and maybe disciplinary actions at school. There's usually a whole complex mix of things. So when people point to one simple thing, whether it's bullying or video games, those simplistic explanations just do not capture the complexity of this issue. Mm -hmm. So, Kate, let's switch over to mass shooters from your perspective. Who is this person that we're talking about? Is there a profile? No, profile is absolutely the word that everybody agrees should not be used. 
Mm. Because profile is when you're looking for somebody without having to know anything about them other than perhaps how they look or their age. Um, And in this case, we have so many other factors. What we're looking for are individuals who express behaviors of concern. You know, even with regard to this concept of we hear, uh, oh, the person who does this is a kid in his basement at his parents' house playing video games who's got mental health problems. And I would say that, that, that the person that we're looking for in that scenario is probably that kid's dad who's upstairs because the average age in the FBI's research is 35 uh, for a mean age 32 for a shooter. And the only demographic that really fits in the category of what we would call a profile is the fact that almost every one of these shooters is male. Um, so we, that's one thing that we do know. But the myths that persist um, help us uh, prevent, really prevent us from looking to the in the right directions. Prevent uh, maybe not the experts who are working on it all the time, but prevent regular citizens who are out there looking for a person of concern from from finding that person. Just last year, the year before, the National Council of Behavioral Health said mental health factors are not a predictive factor. And I think they said that in a very strong tone to say, look, a lot of times we even find people who afterwards, we uh, some psychologist uh, or psychiatrist proffers that an individual shooter who's interviewed afterwards may suffer from a particular diagnosis. But that doesn't mean that that diagnosis even came beforehand. So in fact, people who are getting mental health care, those are the ones who are less likely, right, to do this. And the and the percentage of people who commit these kinds of acts are pretty much aligned with mental health issues, pretty much aligned with the percentage of, it's a very small number, 3%, I think was the last number that I saw. So the prevention aspect of it has to focus on who are we looking for? And the who are we looking for is anybody who has behaviors of concern, because we can predict from those behaviors that they're on a trajectory towards violence. Yeah. And those behaviors, Mark, you know, you've done lots of research through Mother Jones. And one thing that struck me personally was these people just don't snap. They decide, in your words. Now, given given these shootings are premeditated, what does the database reveal in terms of these people that are premeditated and what they do? Well, I think in the broadest sense, the the way to think about this is is to try to demystify some of these big myths that we have about mass shootings and who and who commits them. Um, and this does speak foremost to the, I think the mental illness myth. Um, and you can see this in in the data, whether it's our data set at Mother Jones or the FBI's research or, or beyond. Uh, I think you know, as Peter was suggesting, this is very complex territory and in the sort of more simplistic public narrative, the media narratives, the political narratives that we have around this problem. The problem that, as I see it, is mental illness as as blamed as the primary cause of mass shootings. The reason that's so problematic is because I think that the majority of the public interprets that as crazy. The idea that people who commit mass shootings are completely disconnected from reality, um, don't know what they're doing, uh, and act impulsively. This idea that they just snap, which is a theme that's been around for a long time in the coverage of mass shootings. None of that is true when you study the cases. Uh, These are people who are they have a lot of problems, as Peter was describing, behavioral, circumstantial, and beyond. And mental health is certainly a factor. No, no mass shooter is mentally healthy. But then you look at the the various activities they're undertaking as their process is building toward an attack, uh, the planning and preparation, uh, the interest in graphic violence in previous mass shooters and studying previous attacks, uh, in expressing their intentions through different kinds of threatening communications. These are all the different kinds of data that uh, people are able to see who are studying this problem more in depth. And that tells us a lot about both the behavioral and circumstantial processes that lead up to a mass shooting. That's the key to preventing it before it's too late. Peter, you've, uh, you can add to this conversation about mental illness. Now you've stated that 25% of the shooters had some form of mental illness. That's 75% that didn't. Is there something more you can add to this conversation about the mental health conversation? Well, I think we have to broaden our discussion about mental health and mental illness and recognizes all kinds of ways people can be very troubled 
desperate, depressed, and enraged. And if mental illness means being out of touch with reality, being so-called crazy, then that's just a small piece of the ways that people can be troubled and desperate. So there's so many things that can go wrong in someone's lives. They may have personality traits that make it harder for them to cope with things when they do go wrong. They may have you know, mental health struggles, but they may also have a lot of social struggles. They may feel like they don't measure up. They get into adolescence and they don't keep up with their peers. Maybe they don't do well with uh, dating. They don't have uh, relationships. They uh, maybe are not good athletes. Maybe they're not good students. Maybe they do okay in certain areas, but other areas they're just devastated in. Maybe their family life is falling apart. And of course, we're all affected by things like that that happen in our lives. Again, it's not just saying they're mentally ill. They may be very troubled, depressed, and angry, along with personality traits, along with perhaps mental health symptoms, issues, and so on. But this is not something we can just put our finger on and point to you know, mental illness or blame psychotic symptoms, because in most cases, they don't exist in these perpetrators. Well, you, you mentioned these are not ordinary people and there's warning signs. And Kate, I, I'm really curious, you led a task force at the FBI for five years. And is there some form of artificial intelligence that's searching uh, social media or blogs or video posts to reveal any early signs and characteristics of a shooter? And also, what are those warning signs? Well, I mean, the short answer to your first question is no. The mm -hmm. You can't, first of all, uh, Posting anything online is is free speech, and the FBI is limited in what they're able to search through for free speech. Uh, it's is as important as any other amendment uh, that the FBI is responsible for enforcing. So um, there isn't a of scanning and pulling stuff in from all over. Plus, also the depth. I mean, I think you're talking about picking up a grain of sand. On, on an ocean floor when you talk about the volume of information that's out there on the internet. So that makes it very difficult. So, you know, what are we looking for? You know, the FBI's research is a little different than Mother Jones in that, um, and the Peters research, which focuses, and I think that's the value of having different um, people here. Uh, their uh, FBI's research is more, uh, it is expansive in terms of the where uh, the shooters are and where they shoot. For instance, their, our, our research showed half of the shootings, about half, occur in places of business. So that means that the school issues are, are one concern, and we need to look for school shooters. But since half of them are in places of business, we also need to look for what sets off somebody and com commits an, an offense in a in a business. And those kinds of things have to do with things that maybe maybe a, a you know a student in school isn't necessarily dealing with um, personal loss, uh, domestic disputes, uh, divorce, financial problems such as a bankruptcy. Um, per people who are having conflicts with neighbors and and as Peter mentioned people who are more brittle and they just can't deal with issues in the same way you or I can. Somebody who doesn't get a promotion, uh, who they think they deserve that promotion. We're, so we're looking for sim situations where people may be more vulnerable. And then do they do they act on that by purchasing ammunition, starting to shoot more at the range, gathering, uh, you know, stopping taking their medications, uh, st uh, gathering more information about mass shootings, a a as uh, Mark mentioned. Well, Mark, uh, you're collecting data, and we consistently, as the consumer of information through media, are seeing that information come to us. What responsibility do you feel the media has in this situation and the issues at hand? Well, mass shootings are a complex problem, and in studying them, it, it does raise some really interesting challenges for the media in terms of how we cover them. Uh, the most, I think, important point here is the issue of emulation behavior, what we know more commonly as the, the so-called copycat problem. This has been a growing issue with, with, with attacks and with perpetrators of attacks and also in threat cases that I've studied uh, that the public doesn't know about because they've been disrupted. There are many cases where individuals who are developing a violent plan of this nature 
become very interested in media attention, in coverage of previous attacks. They emulate previous shooters. They look to them for not only inspiration, but also tactical ideas. So all of this raises interesting questions for the news media. And there has been a, a growing um, effort to try to better balance uh, news coverage of mass shootings, essentially putting less emphasis on the perpetrators, denying them the spotlight that they seek to an extent. Although this is also an interesting debate because people have also called for a total blackout of the perpetrators, which I think is also an untenable idea because, of course, the media has a very important role to play here in terms of uh, reporting on something that's very much in the public interest and also increasing understanding of, of the problem so that we can do more to prevent it from a policy perspective. So really it comes down to, a, I think, a, a challenging balancing act here where the media needs to report on who commits these crimes and how and why, uh, but also to do that with, with deliberation and with caution uh, that doesn't necessarily share salacious material just a handful of years ago, we would see uh, shooter manifestos, quote unquote, or their footage shared quickly and 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 rapidly and wildly across the internet uh, without any thought. That has something. That's something that has changed in recent years, which I think represents progress in terms of uh, the issue of of copycat attacks and emulation behavior that that marks so many of these cases. You've all made reference to see something, say something, but not everybody reports or reports on what they've seen or heard. So, Kate, why don't we start with you in terms of why not? Why aren't people reporting this information up front more readily? I think that uh, in general, people roll into a default theory of I don't want to get involved. My kid could never be that way. My neighbor is just kind of weird. He's always been like that. I don't want to have that guy at work mad at me if I turn him in. And the kids who don't want to have uh, the potential repercussions of having someone know at school that they're a snitch. Um, and those kinds of factors, we often see that uh, so many people, you know, if I, as any agent or law enforcement officer would tell you, if you had a dime for every time somebody told you after a crime had occurred when you do a neighborhood canvas that you'll hear them say, oh yeah, I knew he was off. He was just really, I thought he was strange, but they never report it because people don't want to get involved. And, and until people get involved, until we have upstanders instead of bystanders, uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're not, it, we're not going to solve this problem. Kate, Kate well, where do they get involved? Well, that they, what they should do is they should be calling when they see something that's atypical behavior from their neighbors, from their friends, when they see something posted online that they're concerned about. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's really important for, for a listener to understand, a viewer to understand that, say, for instance, you see a, a photo of somebody who's posted a photo of an individual who has a gun, or you have somebody who says something to you that is kind of threatening, but not particularly threatening to you at that very moment. Or they make some reference to how, how they're so proud of the Christchurch shooter and, 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 you know, and they want to be like him. When you report that to the law enforcement agency, to an anonymous reporting system, or even to, um, you know, your school resource officer or to your school or for your HR company at your HR office, then what you allow that piece of information to do is to flow together as a piece of the puzzle to other pieces of the puzzle that you might not be aware of. So you don't have to have all the solutions. You just need to share what you know, um, because we know that there are shootings being stopped all the time. When that happens, when somebody calls in a piece of information where their gut says, this is not right. Could, could I quickly add one thing here? Yes, I, I think there's something else that feeds this problem, too, with a lack of reporting, which is, again, the, the kind of big myths we have about who mass shooters are and what they do, because I think that it can often make people feel like a person they know doesn't fulfill those characteristics. If mass shooters are all totally insane people who just snap. Um, it's that makes it harder to recognize someone who is, uh, you know, more normal in the eyes of the people around them who may be developing dangerous plans of this nature. That's more the reality of these cases. And yet, if we don't talk about it that way in our politics or in our media, I think it confuses people and, and it, it reduces cultural awareness that, that we need for prevention. Peter, we're getting close to the end here of this program, part one, at least. 
And emulation is such a, a, an issue. Is that also an issue for school shootings as well? Because it's very complex, obviously. Sure, we certainly have seen school shooters who engaged in what we call fame seeking. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to go down in history. They wanted to uh, be instantly known all over the planet. And they have articulated this in their writings very clearly. So that certainly is a factor that we see among school shooters as well. Well, as we close part one of our program, mass shootings and school shootings, prevention over prediction is definitely a focus we can take. Now, in next week's program, we'll dive into the topic of preventing mass shootings. Now, as we close part one, can we Americans do anything to prevent future shootings that we haven't already mentioned? Uh, Kate? Lock up your guns. My gosh, lock up your guns. It's not that complicated. You don't need all of the guns unsecured in your house. Lock them up. Yes, Mark? I think in the most basic sense, people need to raise concerns when they have them. Uh, often people have strong instincts if somebody is causing them fear, or anxiety. And if it's uh, of this kind of nature of, of violence, uh, to say something, to reach out to someone who can help. And Peter? You know, in the same way that we talk about various things as taking a village. For me, safety is a community effort. The ongoing theme in my book, Warning Signs, is we're all on duty. So anywhere we may be going about our lives, we may come across a warning sign. We may hear someone threaten somebody or we may see something posted online or on social media. If we take that seriously and report it to the proper authorities, we can be part of saving people's lives. And often it's that simple. In my book, I have multiple examples of people who saw something, they reported it, and lives were saved. Thank you to our guests, Catherine Schweit, Mark Fullman, and Dr. Peter Langman. We really appreciate the insights you brought us. You've helped us better understand the complex issues of mass shootings and school shooters. We can indeed see something and say something. Tune into our next program as we explore the solutions that are within our reach. We really appreciate you, our viewer, for joining us. And as always, we bring you different perspectives on things that matter with people who care.